Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is a presentation that I that I get to do around the country from time to time called Adventures in Expertizing and Why You Should Care. Um, there are really no natural breakpoints in this presentation, but Tom, I think if they, they can raise their hands uh, to ask a yeah, question. Yeah, and, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, and so when we have uh, different questions come in, I will, uh, I will help uh, manage all that for you. Okay, sounds like a plan. Um, I have a uh, PowerPoint. Let me see if I can actually bring it up. And can you see that screen? I cannot see that screen. You cannot see that screen. Well, let me see what else we can do here. Always a conundrum. A conundrum, no less. Yes. Okay. There we go. It's a beautiful thing. Oh, yes. So let me see now if I can actually. OK. Um, so let's, let's talk about expertizing and um, what goes on at the American Philatelic Center when, when we're doing expertizing. So we're gonna be exploring what is expertizing, obviously why you should care about it, that's important to me. Um, I'll chat a bit about the, uh, the American Philatelic Expertizing Services view of expertizing. And the reason I mention that is because not all of um, the expertizing authorities out there uh, necessarily view, view things the same way. So I'll just share with you a bit about our philosophy about it. Um, I do want to review with you some traditional tools of the trade so you have a flavor for how the expert committee goes about doing what they're doing. Um, one of the most fun things uh, from a subject matter standpoint is expertizing inverted jennies. That's uh, plural. Now there are only a hundred of those out there, uh, maybe 99, depending on whether the vacuum cleaner story is true or not. Um, but uh, I've had the opportunity uh, in my, uh, well, in my brief tenure, I've been uh, director of expertizing since last June, I've had the opportunity to get involved in three separate um, expertizing episodes for the Jenny. I do want to talk a bit about uh, what happens when experts disagree, uh, because they do. And then uh, finally, I'll close with uh, some thoughts on the future of expertizing. So expertizing is a process that yields three different kinds of determinations. The first is the identity of the stamp, um, by which I mean, what is the catalog number so that you know what, um, what to call the darn thing and, uh, uh, and, and where to place it in your stamp album. And it could be the Scott catalog number, which is the default catalog that we use at the APS. Uh, but there are many other catalogs that, that can be used uh, instead of or in addition to uh, the Scott catalog number. So identity is the first aspect um, of the expertizing process. The second is authenticity. Is the stamp genuine? Is it what is what was issued by the stamp issuing authority? Or is it some type of fake or forgery or counterfeit? And the difference between a forgery and a counterfeit, at least as we define it, is pretty straightforward. Forgery is intended uh, to cheat philatelists. Um, counterfeits are intended to steal from postal authorities. Uh, <clears throat> overly simplistic, but it's a good working definition of the difference between the two. Finally, the third thing that we uh, opine on, that we issue opinions on, is the condition of the stamp whether it's um, 
got some naturally occurring condition events like toning or a tear, which uh, isn't done intentionally, so it's a naturally occurring uh, element uh, of condition, or an intentional event like trimming or adding perfs or uh, adding fake cancels or overprints. We'll talk about, um, in our opinions, we'll talk about those aspects of condition as well. So the expertizing certificate is the um, final report uh, to the uh, owner of the stamp or cover. Here's an example of what our opinions look like, our certs look like, and it says, uh, this is the expert committee report. And uh, in the small print right below that, it says, um, it is the opinion of the expert committee, and then I get to write up um, what the expert uh, committee has concluded. But I want to emphasize the fact that what we issue, what we all issue in expertizing is an opinion. We may, uh, we certainly do weigh all the facts that we can identify, but the conclusion of those facts is not another fact, it's an opinion. And reasonable people certainly have been known to differ uh, when it comes to the world um, of expertizing. So um, we get about four to 5,000 applications for certificates each year. Um, I won't say this is a typical day's receipts, but it was certainly an interesting day's receipt. You can see that big box uh, on the left there. Um, inside it was one individual's submission of, I think there were 125 applications for certificates, those green forms, 125 of them. That was not the largest submission of certificates by this particular um, member of the APS, um, but it was among the larger that, that he has submitted. He doesn't do this every month, I might add, but there's 125 certs from one, cert applications from one individual. Um, this is also mail that comes in, but as you can see by those green edges, those are all certified envelopes. Uh, some on the bottom are actually uh, registered envelopes. That This represents um, mail coming back from the expert committee. All of the mail between us and them in both directions goes out either certified or registered. The mail that comes in from the owners frequently comes in um, certified, occasionally registered, but I would say eh, maybe a third of the time just comes in from uh, owners by first class mail uh, or priority mail. Um, we simply don't have a problem with lost mail. Has it happened? Yes, of course. Uh, in in the memory of my predecessor and his predecessor, and between the three of us, that's going back um, uh, close to 40 years now, um, there was one certified envelope that didn't show up, and um, we were all set to uh, look into the insurance aspects of it, but six months later, it wandered in. So. Uh, the mailing record is pretty secure. Um, the form, those green applications forms, um, ask the owner to tell us to the best of their knowledge what they assume the identity of their stamp is, meaning the catalog number. Here's an interesting statistic for you, perhaps 40 or 50, 40 or 45% of the forms actually misidentify the stamp. Half of those um, they just get the catalog number wrong that, um, and then philatelists are optimist. If you got two stamps that look really close, the owner is going to think it's the higher catalog value one. That's just how we're built, I guess. Or maybe it's the fact that if they thought it was the lower value one, they wouldn't send it in for a cert. So, uh, it may be a self filtering process. Um, a big portion of that are the, the newer collectors 
who simply don't know how to use a catalog. And uh, I identified the three aspects uh, earlier, just a moment ago, of, of, of what's on a cert. But this is really an educational process, and I'll get into that um, more deeply in a moment. So 40, 45% misidentify. Half of those are just, they get their catalog number wrong. But the other half are stamps that are altered or forged, stamps that are intentionally changed to fool collectors. That's a huge number. Now, for the most part, those are stamps that if they were genuine, if they were uh, unaltered, uh, and, and as, the, uh, as the owner assumed, that they would be pretty high catalog value stamps. You're not gonna fake a 25 cent stamp if you're a philatelic bad guy. Um, but there's just an incredible amount of it. I can tell you that maybe a third of the bad stuff that comes in is in Washington Franklin's. There are so many different varieties where the, um, uh, the imperf is the more value of the, valuable of the two, so perfs are trimmed off, and where, the, uh, just the opposite, where the perforated version is the more valuable of the two, and the bad folks out there are adding perforations. Um, and it's because of just how rife the, the alterations and forgeries are. By forgeries, I'm talking about uh, forged overprints um, rather than the stamp being forged for the most part, or forged cancellations when, when a used stamp is worth more than an unused stamp. But it's those alterations and forgeries that really represent why you should care about getting stamps uh, expertized. And here's the thing, this is true whether you own the stamp already or you're considering buying it. Um, you really need to know what the stamp is. Uh, and then the other aspect is if you're considering selling it before you send it to an auction house, get a cert because if it's an expensive enough stamp, the buyer is gonna want a cert to accompany it. Things will move more rapidly if you get the cert before you send it in uh, to the auction house. Now, um, let, let me read this to you. Um, the mission of the American Philatelic Expertizing Service is to offer services that educate APS members and the philatelic community regarding the identity, authenticity, and condition of the stamps and covers they own or are considering purchasing or selling. But the key word here is educate. This is really about helping our members and the philatelic community at large understand more about what they own. Uh, let me switch over to some of the traditional tools for expertizing. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, before I get there, any questions so far on how we go about, about the process of expertizing and our view of it? I don't, I don't see anybody just yet. Oh, Hal Turner. Hey, Hal, let's, uh, let's get you in there. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead, Hal. First thing that uh, just hit my mind was how often do you encounter forged certificates of authenticity? Ah, <laughs> very interesting question. The answer is not very often, but we saw one of them come in, um, I think it was January. Hmm. So yeah, it happens, but um, not all that often. Okay. Yeah. Anyone try to, uh, to forge a, a certificate to look like uh, one from uh, Apex? Um, I've not seen a forged Apex cert. All of us use embossing devices so that um, 
it makes it a bit more challenging than doing, you know, a pretty photocopy or, sure. or something like that. And um, one thing I can tell you, just to follow up on that, a copy of an expertizing certificate has no effective value. If it's not the original, if it's a photocopy, me personally, I would not rely on it. Very few folks do. That's good information. Yeah, if you're buying something with a cert, make sure it's an original cert. And of course, people could call us and uh, and verify the authenticity of that, right? Um, yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, it depends on on how far back we're going. Okay. A couple, a couple of issues here. Number one, all of the expertizing authorities recommend that certificates be refreshed. That's the phrase we use after five years. Why? Number one, we're trying to sell more certs. No. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> has to do with the fact that information, knowledge about stamps change, um, our ability to expertise improves over time. Expertizing technology is growing all the time, and I'll get into that. It's a good segue to uh, where we're going well, here. Yeah, I have a few more questions before you get that far. Okay, but uh, the, the point ready? is, yeah, go ahead. I'll just say, the, the, the point is that um, if a cert is too old, it may not be possible for us uh, to go back in history and look at the original paperwork. We've got paperwork going back to the 1960s, hmm. but, uh, and of course we started doing this in 1903, so there's a whole body of uh, uh, information and certificates that um, I guess got destroyed in a flood at, at some point, so oh, okay. we have an incomplete history. Uh, okay. What are the other questions? Uh, I'll open Bob's mic. Bob, you have a question. Yes, uh, Gary, um, yeah, Bob here. How frequently are the Washington Franklin pairs and line pairs fake? You know, the more valuable ones. I, I'm under the impression, whenever I receive them in the stamps I buy, I pretty much assume they're fake. Good assumption, good assumption. Um, as far as pairs, line pairs, paste-ups in particular, um, just a huge percentage. I don't, I don't have an actual statistic, but if I had to guess, more than a third of what comes in is not genuine. And the higher the catalog value of the purported stamp, the greater the probability that it's been faked. But it's, it's, it's an incredibly dangerous area because of, of two things. Number one, the collecting interest in Washington Franklin's um, is extremely high. It's a very, very popular area. And because some of them are so valuable, that just adds to the motivation of the bad guys. So, yeah, it's uh, yeah, your assumption is the, is the right one. Can I just comment that I've I, uh, been a collector since 1961. My grandma got me started. And I've been buying and, tw and selling for 20 years to support my habit, and, <laughs> or hobby, I mean. Yeah. And um, I, I find it very discouraging how much fraud is out there, how much these, sometimes they're dealers, and, I, and I've, I've heard stories about them, how much effort they put into making these counterfeits and frauds. It's very discouraging for me uh, as a collector and especially as someone who buys and sells. Um, I, I understand and share your concern. I will tell you that when we get a faked item like that or any faked item, uh, if that's the way we certify it, we put a slip of paper in with each of our returns asking the owner to return them to us to the reference collection for two purposes. One, so that we have an example of a faked case. And number two, simply to get those uh, album weeds off the marketplace. I've so, done that several times, yes. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's very much appreciated because it does serve the interest of the hobby 
to get that trash off the marketplace. Great. Well, uh, thanks, Bob. I'm going to bring George in here. He's got a question. This George? is mostly just out of curiosity, but that box of uh, submissions that you showed, was that yes. sent, in, sent in by a dealer or a collector? A collector. Wow. Okay. Yeah. An enthusiastic collector. I would say so. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's not the only one. Um, we, we don't have many of them, but maybe half a dozen collectors that send us eh, 100 or more each year. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Thank um, you. Yeah. Great. Thanks, George. Uh, Richard had asked a question, um, and maybe you answered this a little bit, the expected lifetime of a CERT. Um, officially, five years. That's our stated policy. Um, and in fact, that's the life of the guarantee that we issue with our certs. We're the mm -hmm. only ones that guarantee our opinions. They're still opinions, but we guarantee them. We put our money where our opinions are, uh, but that's good for five years. Great, okay, let's bring in, uh, let's bring in Rob. Rob, question? Uh, okay, let me, I, okay. Um, yeah, I just chimed in with a question you were talking about what you recommend doing to bad items and they you like to have them donated to the reference collection, of course. But uh, I know that uh, many uh, online venues and sales uh, ask sellers to make sure they're, if it's not a genuine item, to make sure it's permanently marked as fake. How do you recommend doing that? Do you recommend doing that? And how do you do it on a cover? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, some of the individual experts out there who don't issue opinions, but just put their name or initials on the back of a stamp have as a policy that if they get a fake, they will backstamp it uh, fake. Uh, That's what or, I see. Uh, yeah. Uh, we do not do that. It's not our property. It's not our position to do that with somebody else's property. So uh, as a matter of policy, we don't do that. Um, I would certainly prefer to have them sequestered at, um, you know, in our reference collection rather than wandering around out there, even if they have the word fake on the back. I've seen all kinds of examples of um, stamps offered on eBay where the description says fake, but they're pricing it as though it was real. Uh, they, use, they use synonyms for the word fake uh, to, uh, to confuse the ignorant, I suppose. But um, as far as the cover is concerned, yeah. I mean, in my opinion, they all ought to be destroyed. I'm talking about a, a, a Scott listed postal counterfeit cover, for example. Oh, okay. All right. That's, thank you for the differentiation. Uh, when it comes to something like that, I, the back should be noted with, um, with the fact that it, that it is um, not legitimate, that it is um, a known fake. Yeah, yeah, some of those, when it comes to stamps, some of the forgeries are more valuable than the original stamps, the, the Fourniers and Spirellis, Sporatis and things like that. They're highly collectible as fakes, um, but those weren't designed originally to steal from philatelists. Those folks back in the 1870s and 1880s that were creating those uh, stamps we're doing it as space fillers for collectors who couldn't afford the real thing. So uh, it wasn't designed to mislead anybody. And uh, some of that work is just exquisite, uh, detectable by the experts. So um, I would say of all the forgeries that come in, maybe 10% of those are known forgeries by known forgers. You want to uh, want to get back to your presentation, Gary? Oh, sure. Why not? Um, what I'm showing here um, is the box top from a watermark detector. And um, we'll get inside it. And what it says is, directions for use. 
place the stamp face down in the glass receptacle, pour a few drops of carbona or carbon tetrachloride, just enough to moisten the stamp. It would also have been enough to cause lung cancer, but back then we didn't know any better, so we were using uh, carbona, carbon tet, uh, as a watermarking fluid. Nowadays, we use things like Clarity. This is one of a number of brands that are on the market. This particular one, just for your interest, was developed by several members of the APX, Apex Reference, um, I'm sorry, Expert Committee back in the um, 1990s, I guess. It was formularized, um, chemically proven to be totally benign, and then um, APS shared the formula. We don't get any royalties from it. It was done for the betterment of the hobby. So Clarity is one of the several different varieties that uh, members of our expert committee use. Some members of the expert committee um, use Ronsonol. There are certain other expertizing authorities that insist that Ronsonol is the best and most effective watermarking fluid. I did an experiment a while back. I took a couple of cans of Ronsonol, put it into one of these um, watermarking tray trays, secured it so that the Ronsonol could evaporate, but no dust could get in. I will never be convinced that there isn't some sort of residue that's left on a stamp using Ronsonol. My personal opinion, um, I don't stop the members of the expert committee from using it if that is their preference. I will tell you that very few of them do. Most of them use multiple watermark fluid brands because each of them has a unique characteristic and for certain stamps, uh, one brand will work better than others. But um, that's the that's the story on watermarking fluid. And I'm, I've got a whole speech on watermarking methodologies that we don't have time for today, but uh, we can get save into that. that save that for another, uh, yeah. another stamp chat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, nothing's more basic than watermarking to expertizing. Um, here's something called the Cygniscope, which is another uh, a device, one of several on the market that can be used for watermarking as well. There are manual methods that emulate the Cygniscope and its, um, and its peers. Uh, I get the question all the time, should I spend 500 or $200 for a used version of this? And my answer is, it depends. For some stamps, like I'm a British Empire collector myself, it works wonderfully to bring out uh, watermarks. For others, and I am told this about United States stamps, Cygniscope is not as effective. So uh, I don't have any categorical recommendations on this. Um, if you're at the American Philatelic Center, next time you are in, stop by. I'll let you play with ours and experiment with it if you're thinking about owning something like this. Of course, the ultimate in uh, watermarking uh, methodology is this little puppy, which is a VSC 6000. There is not a home version of this. Um, you're, you're welcome to consider purchasing one of these if you've got a spare $130,000, which is the price for, uh, I guess it's the price for a new uh, successor version of this, the, uh, the 8000. But uh, Video Spectral Comparador, that, that uses a wide variety of light uh, types, different spectral positions, and um, there's nothing quite like it for extracting um, shy watermarks from certain stamps. So that's, that's not the only reason we use a VSC 6000, but it's wonderful for that. Let's move on to something else that we're required to do from time to time, which is lifting stamps off of covers so that we can find out what their watermark is or simply removing hinges to look for um, hidden repairs and hidden damages and sometimes hidden watermarks. Um, we always need to get the permission of the owner, but when we do, there's some really high-tech approaches that we use. 
This is the high-tech approach that we use. It's a Tupperware tray with a couple of uh, uh, sponges and, um, and a rack. What you do is you moisten the sponges, you put the rack on top, put the stamp or cover on top of that, seal it tightly. 24 hours later, you have 100% um, humidity atmosphere. And um, very carefully, certain members of our expert committee feel comfortable in removing stamps from covers and hinges from stamps without doing um, any damages. Another tool for every member of our expert committee, but none more so than for ourselves, is the uh, reference collection that we have. And here's a couple of views of our reference collection. Those pretty green and uh, blue binders are um, um, Scott Internationals and Specialized. Shelves after shelves of them. We have about 1,400 different binders, volumes, and other forms of uh, country by country or area by area collection collections. Those include, and you can see down the center aisle off on the, uh, the right side, that back shelf is our reference collection of fakes and forgeries. As with every member of the expert committee, it is extremely important not only to have examples of genuine stamps, but to have examples of the forged ones as well. If you are making a visual inspection of a stamp and you're comparing it, you want to make sure that you have examples of both real and fake stamps. Let me skip over to the inverted Jenny where um, my first day on the job, which was last June, I got a phone call. Very nice lady says to me, I think we've got an inverted Jenny stamp. It's my first day on the job. I'm thinking somebody on the staff is pulling my leg, but no, that nice lady sends me an email with this absolutely horrid scan. Um, there's a little bit more of a close-up on it. This was the stamp that I negotiated. They didn't want to send it to us. They didn't want to let it out of their sight. This was owned by a, um, an aerospace um, museum in Iowa. Um, and they had it hanging on their wall for 10 or 20 years, I guess it was, until somebody came along and said, you know, that's an expensive stamp. And they looked it up and they realized it was $450,000 in catalog value. P.S. I spent two months negotiating with them. They finally agreed to bring it to Omaha this summer to stamp show. At which point, Wayne Youngblood, one of our uh, wonderful experts, took a quick look at it and says, not only isn't it an inverted Jenny, it isn't even a stamp. <laughs> Gary, I was there for that. Oh, that's right, you were. Yeah, I wasn't, uh, you know, too, uh, you know, too far into my uh, tenure either. And uh, uh, you and I were were working on helping to make the connections and get everybody over to uh, to uh, Omaha. And uh, it was a very suspenseful uh, few moments there. Uh, I, mm -hmm. One story I recall. Uh, uh, one of the ladies, um, one of the ladies had uh, the stamp in a in a little uh, wooden box, and the other lady was uh, holding the display that it had been in. And yes. we were walking, we were walking up to the uh, conference room to take a look at it, and I asked the lady with this big display thing. I said, "Can I can I help you at all?" And she looked at me. and goes. Uh, I'd rather keep it with me. <laughs> yeah. And so she'd brought it up there and we got, got it into the room and, um, you know, the, the air just left the room because <laughs> we were all, we were all somewhat hopeful that it would be that way. Uh, they were talking about, oh, we can, hopefully we can sell this and we can build a new hangar for the, uh, Iowa Aviation Museum. And then we took a look and, 
it was not to be. And uh, that was that was sad. So, you know, and then of course, after it was all over, uh, she, uh, the lady with the big display, Grace, she, she allowed me to carry it down the steps uh, because uh, she knew that it was of uh, limited value. <laughs> oh, you're too kind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so that was, that was uh, my first exposure uh, to the world of inverted jennies, uh, at least other than reading about them, which I've done for Two thirds of a century. Well, we did make, uh, you know, we did make a lot of news uh, for uh, yeah. for them and for the APS that day. the The story was was carried by the the New York Times and a number of other newspapers around the country uh, yeah. about uh, you know what what had happened. And so uh, it was uh, it was it was too bad for them. Uh, delight to to meet them, uh, uh, but again, you know, part of that, you know, part of what you do and what your team does every day, kind of, you know, looking at things and hopefully, uh, you know, helping people realize the true value uh, and condition of what they, what they have. And then of course, in a case like this, deflating uh, their yeah. future. So mm -hmm. <laughs> one, one of the impacts that all of that publicity had was that um, the following month in September, an email shows up, with this scan in it, okay? Seems to be like Jennies are pretty common, I guess. What do I know? Here's the other side of that stamp. And if you look in the bottom right corner, you can see a pencil number seven. When this sheet was originally found, the dealer who purchased it was instructed on behalf of the, the uh, stamp collector who owned it, uh, who ultimately bought it, to number every position from one to 100. So this was uh, purportedly position seven. And if you look at, at the right, at the left hand side, you can see clearly that um, there's no perforations on the top. That's because this, this pane of stamps had a natural straight edge across the top. So row one, positions one through 10, had no perfs across the top, natural straight edge. Uh, and you can see that there's a uh, diagonal crease in the lower uh, right corner on the reverse side, viewing it as a reverse side. That damage has been um, noted. We did verify that this was from position seven of the original sheet of 100 stamps. And here's the provenance of that stamp from a website called invertedjennies.com. Wonderful resource for anything you're curious about regarding inverted jennies. You can see where it was originally purchased and the various owners over a period of time. The bottom row shows the auction, the Shreves auction in 1998, at which point the stamp had a catalog value of $150,000. It was sold at auction for $66,000 and then disappeared from the marketplace. Accompanying this stamp was the bill of sale two weeks later. Um, no, less than that actually, because it was still in, it was a week later, because it was still in uh, October uh, for 50% more than that sale price, I think it was like ninety-eight thousand uh, dollars that it was sold for to the person who has owned it since nineteen ninety-eight, and he's the one who um, uh, sent those scans in to us and uh, uh, started the dialogue for the authentication process. So uh, we now know, uh, although he, since he wishes to remain anonymous. Uh, we now know that the stamp has re-emerged and uh, it, it is locatable uh, once again. Now, what, the APS has its own C3A, its own inverted Jenny. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture of the McCoy block, which is the block that was stolen in 1955 and um, 
broken up into four individual stamps, one of which was recovered in 2016 and turned over uh, to the APS um, by the FBI after it was recovered. So um, we had right title and interest to all four. We have retained one, two have been sold, one is still missing. If you happen to come upon that missing stamp, two things you should know. Number one, it's stolen property. It's our property because um, we, we inherited the rights to its recovery. But number two, if you do find it, there's a $50,000 reward. So um, keep us in mind if you see it. Um, I'm just wondering, so you get the reward and then you get a visit from the FBI and uh, how does that work? No, it's the other <laughs> way around. If you find it, if you find it, um, go to the FBI yeah. and they will contact us. <laughs> that would be the better way to do it. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, actually the reward is a very generous $50,000 reward being sponsored by Don Sunman uh, from Mystic Stamp Company, a great supporter of the APS. Um, when that third stamp was turned over at the Javits Center at New York 2016, um, Don Sunman was there and provided the, uh, the funding for the reward to the person who had located it. So very interesting story. Uh, for this particular C3A, the one that we do own that sits in my office and that I get to show to people as they do tours of the American Philatelic Center, uh, we brought in two members of our expert committee, including Ken Lawrence, and he, exa he examined our uh, uh, position 65 stamp. That's the, the number on that particular stamp. And here's some pictures of Ken in action. You can see me watching the master at work here. and. Uh, True to form, we, we did some uh, watermark detection, not because there's a watermark on the stamp, but you're looking for hidden damages or anything else that might be going on. Watermarking is a central part of the process. Um, doing a visual examination, and Ken has his own very special, high power, highly illuminated uh, magnifying glass that he uses, and I wouldn't mind having one just like his. And there he is filling in the little green form. Um, Ken pronounced our uh, our genuine our, our uh, Jenny to be genuine, which uh, was a relief, not a surprise necessarily, but a relief. Okay, so Ken was one of two experts. Wayne Youngblood was the second one who opined on the Jenny, and then we uh, issued a certificate to ourselves, but it's a certificate uh, independently. Uh, created by two of the top experts uh, in the world on uh, on Jenny stamps, and um, it's good that they both agreed that it was genuine. But what happens when experts disagree? Here's a stamp that was sent in to us, and we issued a certificate saying it was a genuine Scott number one fifty four, unused catalog value about seven grand. The owner sent this, because we do not um, talk about centering at all um, and, and just don't comment on, on matters of grading as a matter of policy. Um, this stamp was sent by the owner uh, to get graded and it came back as a 165 with a catalog value about half price from the 154. All right, well, here's, here's that stamp in the middle, along with two examples from our reference collection. The only difference between the two is one's white background, one's black background, but the stamps are the same. So you've got a 154 on the left, you got a 165 on the right, and you have the patient. That's what we call stamps when they are submitted. They're called patients. Um, we have the patient in the middle. So the owner, of course, sent it back to us and um, we agreed to reevaluate it. Of course, we've got our uh, insurance policy, our guarantee on the line. So it's important 
that we either um, confirm the opinion or or pay up whatever financial damages the owner might have uh, experienced as a consequence of of our issuing a, a faulty opinion. So we tried two other experts who hadn't seen it before. Both agreed with our original finding. I can tell you that in addition to that, I put the stamp on the VSC 6000 along with the other two that I showed you. And we um, did a uh, reflectivity profile study of the inks to see whether they were different or not. I also took the stamp up on a, uh, a business trip that we did to Toronto to the Green Foundation, the Vincent Grave Green Foundation. They've got a VSC 6000 and uh, their head of expertising up there is an absolute master at the use of this machine. Uh, he opined on it as well. Um, what we determined is that it isn't about the color or shade alone. There are slight differences. The key here was the paper type. Now, paper type is also problematic when it comes to this particular set of two stamps, because as Scott describes it, the 154 is thin to thick paper, and the 165 is thin to medium thick paper. That's very helpful when it comes to trying to differentiate between the two stamps. Fortunately for us, uh, those two members of the expert committee, in addition to others, have comparable examples of both stamps. And they were able to tell by using no technology at all, by holding the stamp in a tongue and by flicking it with their fingers, that there was a discernible difference in the way those two papers behave and that the stamp in question, the patient, was in fact a 154. So experts don't always agree. We all get it wrong from time to time. Uh, we put our money where our mouth is. We put our guarantee uh, where our opinions are. Um, but it does point out the need for always improving the way you go about expertizing. There's always new technologies out there. There are better ways of doing things that appear all the time. But the future of expertizing is analytical philately. The one example that I've shown you so far is the VSC 6000 for spectral analysis of both ink and paper. And um, we had plans during summer seminar of, or, of uh, offering a course uh, in the use of the VSC 6000. That's kind of up in the air because we're not sure that um, summer seminar is going to take place at all under current circumstances. But we were offering two sections of a two day course in using the VSC 6000. I can tell you those were the first two courses that sold out. Great interest on the people who don't have the equipment to understand how it can be used, and it's a dynamite piece of equipment. In addition to that, though, um, we've got things like X-ray diffraction, XRD, and X-ray fluorescence, which um, enable us to um, determine the elements and the chemical composition of the inks, and indeed of the paper as well, but it's primarily the inks that you're concerned about. Um, this, this is helpful when it comes to the earlier uh, and inorganic inks, but for later organic inks, there is FTIR spectroscopy that works on organic compounds. FT is Fourier transform, and I have a vague and painful uh, memory of trying to do one of those calculations by hand uh, as an undergraduate when uh, we didn't have calculators and we didn't have computers. Uh, I guess in that day and age back then, all I had was an abacus, but um, Fourier transform is a deeply technical 
uh, approach that um, very few have access to, but it's a wonderful tool um, as well for, uh, uh, for ink identification. There are a whole bunch of other uh, tools out there as well. I don't have time to even mention them, but before this COVID-19 crisis, it was my plan to have an APS expertizing laboratory operational by the end of the year and continue to add these tools over a period of time. Not sure where that, um, where that stands at this point. I'm not sure where much of anything stands until we know when we're going to be allowed to reopen and how fast we'll be able to recover from this crisis. But um, the APS expertizing laboratory is something that's definitely on the drawing board. And that's why you should care about expertizing, whether we're talking about watermarking or high tech. Thanks, folks. Thank you, Gary. Uh, we have some we have some questions here. Uh, let's see. We've got. Let me go to Bob, who was asking another question. Bob. Okay, Bob, your mic's open. Yes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I've been buying and selling stamps for a couple decades, and but but I'm feel very lacking in expertise. I've never had the opportunity to, you know, sort of maybe work with a good dealer that that has experience, a lot of experience, but. So I struggle with some of the identifications. I inherited a micrometer from my brother. It's mm -hmm. very um, sensitive micrometer, it's digital. And it seems like I can measure the difference between thin and thick paper. I've been doing that and I haven't had any negative, you know, I haven't had anybody return a stamp and say you were wrong, you know? So is, mm -hmm. do you think that's a pretty accurate way to go? Um. If, I looked if, up the thickness online, you know, somewhere mm -hmm. at one point. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's an essential tool in differentiating uh, thin versus thick. What it can't do is differentiate uh, the different types of paper that may have a similar thickness. <coughs> and high magnification can tell you about uh, the different paper. Um, directions, the directions of the grain okay. uh, during the paper making process. So it's more than just thickness, but a micrometer is absolutely an essential uh, element of every, um, let me call it philatelic laboratory okay. that, the, uh, that the expert committee members are all expected to have. Can I ask one other question about paper? Sure. Exactly, sure. Back in the days when they made the single line and double line watermarks, the double line is usually pretty easy to find. Did the single line watermark always touch every stamp in those big sheets? Nope. Then how, is there a way to determine if a stamp is single line with, you know, nothing there or it's actually a um, no watermark? And how do you tell the difference? If I understand what I'm asking. Um, yeah, I understand exactly what you're saying. And um, I rely on my expert committee when you get into the weeds like that. Uh, my job at expertizing, uh, I describe as herding cats. I manage the experts. I don't make believe I'm one of them. I've been collecting stamps for two thirds of a century, so I know what they're up to. But uh, that's that's deeper. Uh, into the specialized area of uh, Washington Franklin's than I'm qualified to uh, opine on myself, but the members of the expert committee uh, are, are certainly qualified to do that. I think the short answer though, Bob, is that um, if there is no apparent watermark, then there's no way to tell whether it's a single line watermark that got skipped and um, just an unwatermarked uh, alternative. Now that of course depends on whether unwatermarked or single or double exists for that particular uh, catalog number. But uh, if both exist, then I don't know that one can. What I will tell you, however, 
is that that's where the expert committee will come back to us with, with statements like, I think I saw it in the lower right corner, but put it on the VSC 6000 and tell us what you see. The advantage of the VSC 6000, as opposed to stamps in a watermark tray, is that we can take a picture of what the VSC is seeing. So we've got some uh, hard copy evidence uh, to provide support to the expert committee. I will tell you that we are increasingly getting requests from the expert committee for us to do work with the VSC to reconfirm for them what they think they are seeing. We will never replace the experts with technology. So we will not supplant them, we will supplement them. Well, Gary, you may, uh, maybe you'll sneak into uh, HQ and uh, take that uh, VSC 6000 home one day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we have to. Well, I'll maybe I'll you. build one at home, I don't know. That's right, that's right. So uh, don't see, I, ha I have no other questions. Gary, could you stop sharing your screen? Um, let me see. There you go. All right. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for uh, taking part uh, in this uh, stamp chat today. I think it's been a great session. A couple of things I just want to uh, make everybody aware of. Uh, and, and please, members, can you pass the word on this one message? Stamp Store is open. Uh, we do have a, you know, a great selection uh, there in our Stamp Store. We understand that right now uh, we are unable to ship, but if, uh, if, if you are thinking about a purchase, please consider what we, what we have there. It helps support uh, the APS. It helps support all of our dealers, uh, any little bit will help. So if you could uh, look there and see uh, if there's anything uh, available for purchase and you can be patient, that would be uh, really appreciated uh, by all of us uh, at, the, at APS. Uh, we continue the, uh, the, the stamp chats uh, tomorrow. Uh, we have a YouTube uh, premiere tonight. We've got tons of content available on stamps.org. Uh, please pass all that along. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and uh, have a great rest of the day and stay safe and stay healthy, everyone. Good night. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye.